Welcome to Bunny Hugs and Mental Health, the podcast that deals with all things mental health. We talk to professionals, survivors, and loved ones about their sometimes informative, sometimes uplifting, and sometimes tragic stories. I'm your host of the show, Todd Rennebaum, advocate, recovering addict, experienced sufferer of depression and anxiety, and author of the children's book, Sometimes Daddy Cries. Hello and welcome to another episode of Bunny Hugs and Mental Health here on the Saskatchewan Podcast Network. I am Todd Rennebaum. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you for all your feedback and your ratings and reviews. Please keep them coming. Uh, it, it is extremely helpful for the podcast, which is, by the way, free. So, uh, yeah, it, it, you know, if anything, it'll cost you uh, a rating. So that's a pretty good deal. Anyway, today on the episode of Bunny Hugs and Mental Health, I am speaking with Rachel Balsarek. I think I'm saying that right. She has a couple phobias. One phobia really turned into another phobia. And the first one was emetophobia. Or <laughs> ameto is emetophobia. Okay. Uh, it is the fear of vomiting and all things to do with vomiting. Seeing other people vomit, um, looking at vomit, so on and so forth. It actually uh, became so bad that she wouldn't even leave her house, which then turned into agoraphobia. She is a lovely young lady from Edinburgh, Scotland, and uh, she has a really interesting story. Uh, We talk about how she grew up and whatnot and how it turned into what it did and how she's recovered and all types of things. So uh, I'm really excited about this episode and I hope you enjoy it. So, you know, let's get right to it. Without further ado, I give you Rachel Balsarek. I live in the capital city of Scotland, Edinburgh. I've been there. It, yeah, I yeah. hope you liked it. I love living here. I can't really imagine myself anywhere else. Yeah, I loved it. I, I was there during the Fringe Festival. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's such a great time in the city. That was in 1990. Oh gosh, that's before my time. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I was 12 years old, but still I was there. But, uh, oh, and, lovely. Uh, anyway, I have lots of family in Scotland and stuff. So I used to play in a pipe band here in Canada and we um, <laughs> fundraised and did a trip to Scotland. So anyway, yeah. So I feel old now that you weren't even <laughs> born yet when I was in well, Scotland. Well, I was the year after. I was born in 91. <laughs> oh, okay. I was 77. But anyway, so I am old. But anyway, <laughs> okay, now for to the first question. What was your childhood like? My childhood was lovely. I had such a really beautiful upbringing. Um, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I was brought up by my mum and my grandparents. And we lived in the Highlands of Scotland. It was just a lovely place to grow up, um, just surrounded by forests and um beautiful like rivers and walks and just countryside hills for as far as you could see and it was a small village we lived in where kind of everyone knew everyone and it always felt very safe and um, I have quite a big family so they were very present in the village and it just felt like something out of a cheesy film it was beautiful <laughs> very caring very um nurturing and full of imagination hmm. it was lovely what was the name of the village it's uh, you might know it if you're a fan of whiskey or shortbread <laughs> i grew up in aberlauer okay sorry nope haven't heard of it. <laughs> it it's a lovely little place I highly highly recommend visiting if you ever get the chance <laughs> I may have driven through it when I was there, when I was 12 years old. I don't know. But um, so kind of talk about leading up to your, your phobia and, and maybe what caused it and what was going through, you know, what was what was life looking like at that time? Um, I don't ever remember a time when I didn't have some level of fear of vomiting. It's not something that has a clear 
beginning. Um, there, there's no event that I or any of my family can think of that started the phobia of vomiting. Um, there was no time that I was like specifically very ill or someone around me was very ill or anything like that that really started it. It's just always been a very present part of when I was a child, it was a very present part of my nighttime, like as I would start to get ready for bed, I would start to feel more and more sick. I would start to be terrified that I was going to be sick. And every single night it was a fight with <laughs> a fight with my mum about I'm definitely going to be sick. I'm gonna be sick, mum. Like check my temperature, check my check my pulse, like because she's a nurse. So she she would be like, no, you're you're fine, you're fine. Um, but it was just always such a very present worry in my young mind that it was going to be a thing that happened. And I don't know why it caused me such anxiety. Like, if you're sick, you're sick, you know, you just throw up and you get on with it. And I knew that then and I know that now, but there was just something I couldn't get past in my mind that caused it to be such a problem. Hmm. Uh, I, I, I when I listened to you on the other podcast, I actually, I kind of stopped for a second. I was like, cause I had a fear of that as a kid, but yeah. not, not nearly as bad as you did. I mean, I didn't think about it daily. It was like, I just really, really hated throwing up. And I remember. It's not really something anyone enjoys. It's not meant yeah. to be enjoyable. <laughs> it's your body going, yuck, I hate that. That might be dangerous. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. <laughs> I'm sure there's no. Yeah, parties out there where all they do is throw up. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in like the Greek times or something. <laughs> See, when I learned about that as a kid and that came up in like a history class, I was like, are you joking? That cannot have been a thing. <laughs> Seriously, that's a thing? Yeah, like back in the Roman times, um, people would eat to excess and then they would go to, I think they were called like vomitoriums or something, where they would purposely make themselves throw up. It was like purging. It was like an er early form of that. And so that they could eat more and enjoy more. And I was Work. just like, you can't be serious that people did that because why would you ever make that happen? I mean, I've done that with alcohol, but. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's for your own good a lot of the time. And like, it's it makes you feel better a lot of the time if you're unwell. But to me, I would rather go like a full week feeling nauseous than get it over and done with. Now it's different. Huh. But back then it was just like, no, couldn't do it. Yeah, I remember like bawling my eyes out anytime I cried. I mean, anytime I, I threw up. Yeah. And my parents had their bedroom next door, and I remember throwing up one night. I was like grade seven, so I don't know, 12 years old maybe. And I remember my dad saying to my mom, why is he crying? <laughs> and then uh, I, I never cried again after that. I was like, why am I crying? I don't get it. Like, it's just, I just barfed. It's not... Um, well, I yeah. can kind of understand because it's such an unpleasant sensation, but also yeah. there's a part of it that's just like a complete lack of control and your body's doing something completely out of your own will. Yeah. And I think that is maybe what is rooted in it for me is a sense of control and losing control because mm -hmm. I personally don't drink um, mm -hmm. and I never have. And I think it's about the control aspect as well. I don't also like, you know, I don't want to throw up, but like... <laughs> <laughs> But there's the whole control aspect to it. And I do know that I have the gift of hindsight. I think it was wanting to have control of something. Hmm. Right. Well, I don't drink either now. I've been sober five years, but that's a whole other story. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so the, it's a big what, achievement. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, so you don't know what caused maybe the escalation? Like what took you from just being scared to like now it's a daily thing that I'm constantly in fear of hmm. um i think that was when a lot of different factors in my life left my control and it got difficult to deal with and i hmm. think because of that it then became a bigger thing in my mind and then that led to the agoraphobia and um unfortunately i lost my grandfather um and then he was like a, a father to me like he raised me and was a huge part of my life so that was very difficult and also a couple of months before that um my little sister was born so it was a time of like great 
big changes in my life. I was 14 years old. I'd been an only child up to that point. And so that was like a huge thing to happen. I was having to share my mom with someone else. Um, There was like all these baby things involved that I had never really experienced before. And then there was like this great sadness and loss as well. And also seeing my mom go through not only like such a huge change of childbirth and being a new mom, but also losing her father and and very close with my mom. So I think these things as well, like being 14 years old is hard enough on its own. And then you've got these aspects as well. It was a lot of big storms that just suddenly hit one after the other and created this huge typhoon of not having control of anything. And I think I then created a lot of bad habits in myself and created a lot of um, like that anxiety came out in very unhealthy ways um, to a point where I was trying to control it in ways that were more detrimental than helpful. So what, what did, oops, sorry. How did it affect your, your daily life at this point at 14? It was, was it like constantly all day, every day thoughts, or was it just more ritualistic at bedtime kind of stuff still? It, it, was, it had expanded to every moment of every day at that point. It was a slow process um, from these big things that happened, um, but it did just very efficiently creep into every part of my day and every thought I had. So I would be at school and I would start to worry about everyone in the classroom. I would worry about if they were going to be sick, if I was going to be sick in front of them, how could I hide myself? How could I hide from them if that was to happen? Hmm. Um, So that became, it became so present in my mind. I didn't really have any space for any other um, thoughts, memories. It was just being on high alert and survival mode all the time. And um, I started to really control what I ate as well because I didn't want to be sick. So I would start to eat what I classed as safe foods instead um, so that I wasn't putting myself at risk. So Hmm. nothing that had like a very strong taste, nothing like I kind of (laughs) In adv- like I've, <laughs> I've, been, I've been to Scotland. There's there's a lot of bland food there. <laughs> there is a lot of bland food here. I was in a great place. <laughs> <laughs> but I also like I said I became like vegetarian because I was scared of meat because if you undercook it, I could have gotten food poisoning and things like that. Like it was weird control that I was implementing in my life. Hmm. Would would haggis make you puke? I mean, I'm sure it makes some people cute, you know, like I've, I've seen, I've seen some, I am a fan, I guess, <laughs> the vegetarian kind, right, that right. The lamb stomach can keep itself away from me. <laughs> so when you're that age and like, you know, to this day, I'll be watching TV and mo- movies and people will. You know, they show them, especially comedy, you know, toilet humor, people are barfing and stuff. What would that, what would that do to you when you were watching TV at that age and you'd see that? I would freak out so much. I couldn't understand why it was funny. I was like, why are people <laughs> laughing at this? This is terrifying. This is horrible. <laughs> I can't, I, it, I was constantly, anytime I was watching something, I was on edge in case that would happen. Uh, you, you mentioned being in class and you're worried about uh, throwing up in class and having to hide was that uh, almost uh, a bigger fear or the the fear of puking or the fear of people seeing you puke? Um, for me, it's both. I'm scared mm. of both. Um, I was scared of both. I, I'm a lot better now. It's not really a part of my life, but at the time it was, no one could see me. And even if I was sick, I wouldn't even let my mom near me. I couldn't have her witness it. Yeah, uh, so she'd be like trying to come in. She's like, "Are you okay?" I'm like, "Leave me alone! Yeah, I'm, <laughs> don't come near me! Don't look! I'm the same <laughs> don't listen!" <laughs> I'm still like that, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm the same. I'm a very, I'm a very private. I'm like one of those dogs that's like, I'm near the end. I no one can witness this. I need to go hide. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I'm doing an entire show about barfing, but 
<laughs> you know what? It's a real thing, and it's a ter- it's a terribly sad thing. I found that after I did the episode of This Is Actually Happening, so many people contacted me and were like, thank you so much for talking about this. I thought I was insane because no one else seems to have this phobia, and it was like you were talking about my life, and that honestly made me so happy yeah not that they oh god i wish that no one else had it but like (laughs) it made me so happy that people didn't feel as alone as i did at the time because things that you're saying like the like comedy shows and stuff i was like am i insane am i the only person that's bothered by this to this degree (laughs) it made me feel crazy but like it's a real thing and phobias of everything are out there well i can tell you my wife every time she sees someone barf on tv uh, it, she waits like two seconds and she kind of winces her face and goes, gross. Every time, <laughs> without fail, every time. That's um, such a lovely response. <laughs> <laughs> I actually say it before she does now and she and she thinks it's funny. Uh, but anyway. Um, uh, next question. <laughs> <I'm trying> to... <laughs> Off on a tangent. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I prefer it to sound like a conversation, not like I'm just going down a checklist of questions. But <laughs> no, I love that. That's great. <laughs> uh, so, uh, well, we kind of covered that. Um, you mentioned your eating changed. Uh, it, did anything else change, like your sleep or your, uh, I don't know, other habits or other daily kind of things that we take for granted? Yeah, for sure. Um, my eating changed based on when I felt like I could eat so I wouldn't eat at least an hour before I had to travel anywhere because my I was like my stomach has to settle otherwise I'll get travel sick um so traveling was like a whole thing that I had to plan around and um I was terrified the entire time I traveled anywhere my sleep as well was heavily affected I wouldn't get to sleep until like 4 a.m every night um I would just I tried to go to bed and a a large part of this was because I had my brother and sister who were babies at the time. Mm. I was terrified about waking them up and that caused a lot of anxiety about sleeping. Um, So I'd I'd have to sit downstairs and (laughs) this is when I watched like the entire back catalogue of Disney films up until 4am every single (laughs) night. Um, And I would eventually out of exhaustion go to sleep, but the whole night I would have a bucket next to me. Like I'm going to throw up any moment, any moment it's going to happen any moment. And then I'd finally pass out at 4 AM. I'd have to get up at seven to go to school. I was just like a zombie. I had no sleep. And even when I did sleep, I wasn't relaxed enough to like dream at all. And I wasn't rested. I wasn't, I was very malnourished as well because of my eating habits. I was just a mess. And it's, I really makes me sad to think of me like that now. Like I just want to hug her because it wasn't living. It was just surviving. Right. Yeah, man. So every night was like that every day you're exhausted. Plus, like you said, malnourished. Yeah. That'd make for a, a long, uh, day, but not just day because it's every day. Yeah, I don't, I honestly don't know how I got through school with the grades I did. (laughs) I don't, I don't know. So having two like infants in the house, they're always barfing. That must've been hell. It was terrifying. Like kids get every, every illness around. Like if you have kids, you know that like one of them's going to get it and then the other one will get it. But even just drinking milk. Uh, yeah, uh, like just drinking milk too fast, they spit up. And <laughs> yeah. there were a few times they did that on me, and I oh. didn't mind it as much because it was just milk. Oh, okay. um, but I was still scared of it. Um, yeah. but then they started eating solid foods, and anytime they threw up, I was so scared of them. And mm. that's so upsetting because they're like three years old, and they're big sister. Like I love them; we play together. Um, I look after them, and then suddenly your sister's like keeping a firm distance between you when you want comfort from her. I felt like such a monster. Hmm. Uh, So at 14, 15, or, you know, whatever age this is now that we're talking, did you have coping mechanisms then other than watching non-vomiting Disney movies? (laughs) 
Maybe that's why I like them so much thinking about it. <laughs> um, I didn't know how to deal with anxiety. The way that I dealt with it was like trying to slow my breathing down and just taking deep, slow breaths, which is like a genuine um, kind of thing that you're meant to do when you have um, any sort of panic attack is like slow your breathing down. It slows your heart rate down and brings you back down to a state of calm. And I tried to do that, but it was always so hard because it was like trying to battle my lungs that weren't listening to me because I was so anxious. I was in such a state that it was like fighting, like going the wrong way up a river or something. It was like trying to push against an impossible force that was trying to get you to spin out of control. Right. Um, yeah. So that was something I tried to do. Um, I also listened to a lot of music um, at the time. I would just put it up really loud on headphones and try and focus on that, especially when I was traveling. Um, and mm. that it kind of helped. It was just kind of hanging on till it left me really, like any sort of panic I had. And it's, it's kind of a way to get through a panic attack is to try and ride it out and just kind of know that there's an end in sight at some point and to just make it through. But I wasn't doing it willingly at that point. I was kind of doing it out of desperation. Right. Um, I don't know if you can hear, but normally I turn my furnace off. So, so like, because, you know, it makes a sound during recording, but it's been... I uh, can't hear it, but I hope no, you okay, can't good. hear the traffic outside my window. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I did, and I heard a dog oh, going... sorry. Tch, tch, tch. No, that's oh, gosh, okay. Yeah, you can probably hear my dogs. No, that's okay. I'm scuttling um, by it. I left the furnace on now because it's, well, it's like minus 20 here, but... Yeah, it must be so cold with you. <laughs> It's actually, this is the nice, this is the warmest day we've had in like two weeks. It's been minus 35 for the last two weeks. So, um, so anyway, if you hear that, I, I hope it's not distracting. Um, so w when did you kind of go from this daily thing? Well, I mean, which is already, you know, pretty extreme to like, when did it really amp up? Was it at the end of high school? Or, no, no, actually I know when it was. I listened to it this morning. <laughs> you, you, you left you left home and went to university, and that's kind of when it amped up. Yes, um, that is when it kind of really got out with my control. And I'm not sure if that was because I moved away from home, and so I didn't have the support of my mother then, and because. I was kind of on my own. I was independent and I didn't have, <laughs> my mum's a big fan of a strict regime of getting up at a set time and going to bed at a set time. And I hate to admit it, but she's right. <laughs> <laughs> if you're very strict with your sleep schedule, it really, it keeps you on track. It keeps your life on track. Um, mm -hmm. And so when I moved away and I was a student, um, I kind of, I became nocturnal very quickly because I still was doing a thing where I couldn't sleep, even though it wasn't a thing about my brother and sister and waking them up anymore. It was still like nighttime safe, daytime's not. And I don't know why it was like that in my head. Hmm. Um, but that really messed with my sleep schedule. And then going to classes of like lectures of like a hundred odd students where um, I'm in this big lecture theater. So there's like so many more people now that can like, see me if I'm ill like that became such a scary thing to me as well um and I found it impossible to socialize with people because they wanted to go out drinking fair enough if you're a student that's what you're gonna do to socialize I completely understand that but mm -hmm. it wasn't what I wanted to do and um I just really lost touch with other people and I kind of lost touch with any slim amount of control I had and I don't know if you remember, but this was the time way back before coronavirus <laughs> where there was bird flu um, that oh, was a yeah. thing. And I caught that because, uh, you know, like uh, universities are like hotbeds for <laughs> illnesses anyway. Right. Um, and so I was very ill for like two weeks with this horrendous flu. And I didn't go out during those two weeks. And at that point, I was just like, I 
I don't want to go back outside because it's scary out there and I don't have any control out there and I have a bit of control here, so why would I leave this? So when you had the bird flu, did you vomit? I didn't. Um, uh. I, I, I went for a really long time without throwing up and I'm not sure if that's just through sheer stubbornness or luck, <laughs> um, but I went, uh, gosh, I would say probably about 10 years without hmm. throwing up um, between the ages of, no, probably 15, between 12 and 23. Um, hmm. Good stretch. I know, right? And <laughs> I, I don't know if it's because I was crazy stubborn or fighting it like crazy, but yeah. Hmm. Uh, and I don't know if it would have changed anything if I had, if I'd maybe be like, that wasn't right. so bad. Why, why was there such a big fuss? Well, that's what I was wondering, that, what is it, exposure therapy? It's like if you were, had, had thrown up or been around lots of people throwing up, would it, would it have kind of settled your anxiety about it a bit, I wonder? Um, when I was looking at lots of different types of treatment, that was one of the ones that I looked at, and I read a lot of different accounts of people who had been through that. Hmm. And it really scared me, but fascinated me. I don't know if this is a thing with other people when they have phobias, but I was like, okay, knowledge is power. So I like heavily researched everything it is that makes you sick and the whole process of it, like the biological, like everything that happens when it happens to try and give myself peace of mind and also maybe a bit of morbid curiosity. <laughs> but the exposure therapy was very interesting because one person was saying that, um, their therapist watched a lot of um, video of it with them and like audio with them mm. and then they discussed it and then they would like um, gosh I can't remember the name of it but it's the, the thing that makes you sick um, yeah that medicine that yeah 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 and um, that encourages it um, and then the therapist would like be there with them when that happened um, and mm. a lot of the time I was just like, God, this poor therapist, like, I, I don't imagine you'd be paid enough to sit and watch that with someone and then sit with them during that. But um, it <laughs> yeah. just like, it terrified me as well, the idea of doing this. Um, so it wasn't something I was ever brave enough to do. So you, you only spent a few months in university and decided I can't handle this? The first time I tried university, I was there for, I think, two months and then my mom was so worried about me that she came and got me and she said that when she picked me up she was absolutely terrified for me because I looked skeletal because I hadn't been eating enough um, I was just so gaunt with anxiety and stress and like not going outside so I was pale I was like a gray color and she was just like no I need to take you home and I need to get you back on your feet Hmm. Uh, I looked it up. It's Ipecac. Ah, thank you. Yes, that was it. I was terrified <laughs> of that substance of ever coming across it. <laughs> <laughs> Tequila works too, but. <laughs> Take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming I wasn't a tequila drinker. <laughs> uh, so this is about the time. So when you move back, that's about the, the time it became so unbearable and so uncontrollable that you kind of started to get the agoraphobia? Yes. Um, it started probably as I went to university and when I came back and I just kind of let it just engulf me. I mm. was just so tired of fighting to go outside. I was so exhausted of just fighting this fear all the time that I just kind of let it control me for a while because I was so exhausted mentally of just struggling for every single step mm. um, and it was just such a bleak time because um, as I said in the podcast like like I'm not even a little bit mad about it but my <laughs> my um, mom had um, it, we lived in a three-bedroom house and my mom had a room my sister and my brother so there was no bedroom for me anymore because my sister moved into my room what was my room because she was growing up and she needed her own space um, but that meant that I had to live in the attic of the house. Um, I was like reverse Harry Potter. I wasn't under the stairs. I was over them. <laughs> and it was just such a weird like, place to, 
to be to find myself because there weren't any windows up there when I first moved in and um, I had to go up and down a ladder to get in and there wasn't a door I could close it wasn't really meant for anyone to stay in um mm. because I was meant to be off at university I wasn't ever meant to like within a couple of months have to come back home um which I felt really bad about as well and I was like up there above them I felt like a just really grumpy poltergeist who was just miserable all the time just like haunting the top of the house um and I do I feel really bad I worry that it was a horrible presence to have lived with for so many years but I also know that I wasn't in control of myself at the time I couldn't be any different than I was because I was just consumed by this terrible condition that had just really taken over every part of my life um I found it really difficult to even go out to our garden at that point um my mum would go to work in the morning she'd make sure I was up <laughs> with the very strict getting up and going to bed schedule <laughs> that she was like come on Rachel wake up you gotta hate life <laughs> get up Rachel you got a busy day of nothing yeah um, <laughs> I'd get up in the morning and they'd all go to work and school and I would just kind of sit and I would read a book or I'd play video games and I'd look outside for a while and I'd be like, am I going to do it today? Hmm. And it would just, my whole day would lead up to walking the dog because that was the one thing I had to do every day was to take the dog out and I loved our dog very much. And it was very smart of my mom to be like, you got to do this because it was one thing I was responsible for every day and I would have felt terrible if I hadn't done it. It wouldn't have been the end of the world. He could have waited until mum got home, but it was a responsibility I wanted to be able to do. And uh, I did it every day, but it was such a struggle and my whole day revolved around this one like 15 minute dog walk, which (laughs) It's crazy because all my other friends were like off getting degrees or like having kids or getting married. And my whole life revolved around walking a dog once a day. (laughs) And it was like, it was a really bleak thing, but it was also kind of funny looking back on it. (laughs) Right. So was that about the only time you would ever leave the house was to walk the dog? Yes. Um, I would sometimes try and go out with my mom if she was like going to a shop or something and I'd like Mm. build myself up to it but a lot of the time I couldn't force myself to do it and like I have a really good friend that I'm close with and he would come and visit me every so often but like that was the only time I had any other contact with anyone that wasn't my family for like five years Mm. and like in-person contact right uh, by the way, you said earlier, Grumpy Poltergeist, and I think that'd be a cool band name. Oh, man. Right. If anyone feels <laughs> that, I'm coming to haunt them. <laughs> That's a great band name. <laughs> At least an album name. <laughs> Changing all my internet handles right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> no, that's great. <laughs> so I'm assuming you must have had some other, like this obviously cause other mental health issues like depression and well maybe just depression I don't know yeah um I it was a lot of the time when sorry you asked if that was the only time I ever went out I was oh, wrong right. about that I also oh, okay. went to the doctors a lot and um, any doctor's appointments because we were trying to fix this it wasn't just like yes this is my life now and um, mm. we were desperate to find some sort of answer and some sort of solution so I would go to the doctor like every couple of months and they prescribe something new um so like that was a very big part of it um I'm so sorry I just forgot what you asked me there because <laughs> I, I remembered that I was like that's important to talk about <laughs> um I don't know no I'm kidding I asked about uh, uh depression depression sorry yes um and that's what reminded me of it um doctors a lot of the time would try and treat the depression and weren't listening to the fact that the depression was caused by an anxiety. Mm. Um, if I didn't have this like overwhelming panic disorder and phobia, there would be no depression because 
I didn't have anything else to be depressed about. I had nothing else in my life that would be causing depression. Um, and if we treated those, then the depression would probably go away. So I was diagnosed with depression and general anxiety disorder. Um, and it took a long time for any sort of medication to have any slight um, impact on that. There were ones that helped slightly, um, like that would slightly lessen the, the symptoms that I was having that made it slightly easier, but it was a very tough time of trying a new medication, going through the two weeks of like your body acclimatizing to it, seeing how it worked for another couple of weeks and then coming off of it going through the withdrawal of coming off of it and then trying something new again. And it was just a constant month to month of going through that process. And I got so like physically exhausted by that as well as mentally, because it was a lot to put your body through. It was a lot to put your brain through. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the side effects that you would get were just so horrible. And a lot of SSRIs, which you come on, you go on for depression and for anxiety, are known to have nausea and vomiting as side effects. Mm -hmm. So I was terrified of that. And the nausea that they were giving me, I was barely eating anything a lot of the time. So I was very dangerously underweight. I was dangerously malnourished. I was exhausted all the time. It was just really not helping any sort of symptom that I was going through. But we were just desperate for something to work, anything to work. Um, hmm. So that was a really rough kind of time to go through. Yeah, it sounds like a nightmare. It was horrible. <laughs> Four to five years in an attic, taking different meds every few weeks. Like, uh, honestly, like... anyone that's going through that at the moment, it's such a rough time. And I'm so sorry, but it's, something is going to alleviate what you're going through. And some of them might make it worse and that's horrible, but at least it's a, you know, that that's not the solution and it's not a question mark. Hmm. Were you ever suicidal at any point or at least have suicidal thoughts? Yes. Um, there was a lot of time when I was just like, I don't want to carry on like this. It wasn't, I want to die. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it was just like, well, I'm not really living a life right now. So like, what's the point? And there, there were a few times when I did have a plan of what I was going to do and when I was going to do it. And just, it, it was usually when, because my family would go on holidays in the summer. Um, so it was like, okay, they wouldn't be around during that time. So that would be perfect. And just get everything ready. And just the thought of, my mom finding me, I couldn't ever fully go through with it. Mm -hmm. And during this time period, our neighbor, unfortunately, her brother um, took his own life. Um, and it was there in their home. Oh. Um, and just witnessing what that did to her and witnessing the impact that had on their family really kind of made me realize that I couldn't do that to mine. And even though I was going through so much pain, I was suffering so hugely. Um, and I felt like I had no direction. I wasn't going to ever achieve anything. I couldn't do that to the people that loved me and knew me so well. Um, and it just kind of pushed me to keep trying to carry on for just a little longer and see if there was a way out that mm. wasn't so final. Mm -hmm. um, shit. <laughs> I do this every time. <laughs> I knew I should have wrote it down. <laughs> I had a follow up. Oh, uh, did you ever consider a, a hospital stay like in the psych ward or something like that? I was very adamant that I wanted that. And mm my doctor would just not let me do it and my mom wouldn't either um and i was i was really desperate 
because I felt like such a huge burden to my family. Mm -hmm. Um, I just wanted to not be their problem for a while. And I also wanted someone to just look after me so that I didn't have to be trying to do this alone. Um, Because as much as my family was trying to help, like they had lives to live. They didn't have the time to like take me to the hairdresser and hold my hand for an hour or like try and shuttle me to and throw appointments. And I kind of wanted them to have a holiday from me, to be honest. Right. Um, and I wanted to kind of have a holiday from myself as well. Uh, and they just were, they wouldn't let, they wouldn't let me. They said that I wasn't a, enough of a danger to myself. Um, and I wasn't, mentally ill enough to be put there and I think it was just they didn't want me to be in a situation that was so out of my control I think they thought it would do more harm than good and Mm -hmm. because my mom's a nurse she's worked in places like that and I think since she's worked in like mental health facilities I think it's come a lot a long way and I think she saw it in a far more uncaring way um I think she was worried to put me somewhere like that and um, mm-hmm. I think I hope that places are a lot more kind and a lot more thoughtful about their patient relations hmm. well I've spent time in the psych ward and it's it's I there were times where I was like I think I feel crazier in here than I would if I was just at home. And and it's not that I didn't get good care. It was just mm. it, you're with a whole lot of people with a whole lot of problems. And it's like, wow. <laughs> like, I'm one of these people, <laughs> you know, not, not to judge other people's mental illnesses, but it's like, yeah. like you're around a lot of really sick people. And it's like, wow, like I must be pretty sick if, you know, if I'm in here with these people, which then made me feel even more sick, right? As opposed to, like, yeah. but ultimately, it, you know, I, I was meant to be there. <laughs> it was, a, it was a good thing I was there, but um, yeah, there were times where I was wondering why the hell I was there and what the hell was going on. But um, so eventually you, you ended up finding a psych nurse that, that really helped you, that listened to yeah. you and, um, like you were saying, the doctors were helping your symptoms, but not the cause. Whereas it sounds like she kind of, kind of found more of the root of the cause or. She just kind of treated me like an equal and a person. Whereas a lot of the time with the doctors I was seeing, it felt like I really was just their allocated time slot of a patient. I didn't, I wasn't really a person. I was just, okay, try this try this now what's your symptoms okay here's this um and she actually spoke to me and made me feel a lot more like a person an individual rather than just a one-size-fits-all try this medication next um and I honestly do think she saved my life uh she because we had spent so long building a relationship of trust. I trusted her when I was then, it was then suggested to me to try a different medication, which had slightly scarier symptoms of side effects than I'd previously come across because they were now moving on to antipsychotics. And I was like, really, is that what I need? Like, does that mean I'm psychotic? Like, what is that? Like, what does it mean? And she very much just kind of looked at me and went, I've been on these. I was on these because of postnatal depression. Like I really suffered with it and, you know, maybe it will be what you need. And if it's not, then we'll just move on to the next. It's no big deal. And she had built such a bond with me that I felt like I could take the step and be like, okay, yeah, let's try this. I'll give it a shot. And it was finally that medication that worked, but it really kind of, it had a lasting impression with my mom as well on the, now when she has mental health um, patients that she's seeing, when she has like patients that she's treating and 
um, she kind of notices that they have symptoms of mental health um, and mental illness, she will actually spend the time to speak to them and get to know them and kind of thinks more about what might be going on in their life um, because she saw what a genuine change it made to me with this nurse. And I spent so many years after like updating her on where I was like, oh, I'm going to graduate next year from university. I'm moving away. I'm doing this. And like, I just, I bought her flowers like <laughs> every year just because she really changed everything um, for me. And um, it really made me think as well more about how I treat relationships with other people, how I speak to other people and how I think about what might be going on in other people's lives. Because mm -hmm. that human response from her just really made all the difference. Yeah, it's true. I, I, I've been through, well, I've been in the psych ward, I've been through addiction treatment and then I worked in addictions for a while too. And it's, it's amazing how just not non-judgmental, um, empathy and compassion and just listening, like you said, just act genuinely listening to, to the symptoms, you know, instead of, a, you know, write down the symptoms and we'll treat the symptoms. It's yeah. Actually listening to. Yeah. What's causing that. Yeah. Yeah. I really, yeah. I'm such a big believer that everyone should go to therapy at yep. least once because humans aren't meant to fight what's going on in their head on their own. They really need to speak about it and let it out and get a second opinion even. Mm -hmm. Just a second non-judgmental, non-biased opinion on what's going on in your life can change everything. Yeah. I mean, huge companies bring people from the outside in to um, like cons consultants and stuff, right? Like yeah. having, having an outside eye seeing in, like if billionaires are doing it for their companies, you know, I think individuals, it's, it's okay to do too, to have someone just take a look and listen and, and maybe point you in a, the right direction. It's like the, uh, the definition of insanity, um, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. And it's like, you need that other, uh, perspective. Yeah, I agree. A hundred percent. And if people find the word therapist intimidating, then outside consultant is definitely the way to go. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Because, you know, a lot, a lot of men have a hard time with, with this stuff. And it's like, yeah, maybe maybe it's the, the language we use more than uh, than anything that, that would get men to do it. So I, yeah, I got a 3 p.m. meeting with my consultant. <laughs> yeah. Uh, personally, I'd rather therapist because uh, I don't need consulting. No, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, so that that must have been the turning point for you then. Um, yeah. And so, did you start some other types of therapies too, other than the medication? Um, I still saw my psychiatric nurse for at least a year after the medication I started on started working. Um, because they didn't want to, and um, they didn't want to just kind of leave me to it. You know, they wanted to keep me as a patient um, for the next while, uh, just to make sure that everything was working and I wasn't just throwing myself into things. Um, but it did take probably about a year before they um, stopped seeing me as a patient. Um, but I still kept in touch. I still kind of every so often just popped by and was like, hey, I'm doing this. And I just wanted to say thank you again. Um, mm. So I I didn't, because it had been such a long and hard road, I didn't want to immediately kind of take all, off the off the safety wheels, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, like it, the change in me was so incredibly huge that, it wasn't a necessity anymore. It was more a kind of just in case. Um, I, I was doing so well, but also I needed to relearn a bunch of things about how to function as a normal person because I'd been in survival mode for so long that I needed to remember what was like socially normal, how to act and 
I also needed to work out what I wanted to do with my life and how to get there. And it was a lot to suddenly have on my plate, but it was so exciting to have almost like real life things to do rather than just what I'd been living with previously. Other than walk the dog? Yeah, <laughs> which I still did. <laughs> right. <laughs> you were walking him twice a day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sometimes three if I wanted a treat. <laughs> so how long did it take from that first kind of meeting uh, with the psych nurse and starting the new meds to actually like, oh, maybe I'll start going outside more and going for dinner and socializing. Was it a real fast turnaround or, or, or was it gradual? It was quite gradual because I'd take a few steps too quickly and then I'd kind of freak myself out a bit and I'd mm. have to kind of try and do it slower. And it wasn't like a magic fix. It wasn't like I was suddenly fine. Um, mm. I did still have panic attacks and I did still have like moments of very deep depression and just kind of mourning all the years that I had lost to this and like all the progression in my life that I had to put on hold because of it. Mm. Um, so it wasn't like happy ending roll the credits it was like a very long it was probably it was a year after the medication started working that I stopped seeing my psychiatric nurse and it was probably two years until I was ready to actually try and go to university again and and move out again and try all these things again and because I had to build up the confidence as well and I had to um kind of work out what I was going to do and how I was going to do it and so, who I was going to be. <laughs> right. So who are you? What did you do? How old, actually, how old, how old are you now? I am 30 years old now. Okay. So, so you, you did go back to university? I went back to university. I have, I now have a qualification in fashion technology because I went to college first and then I did a four year degree in costume and design and construction for theater and film and i worked a bunch of freelance jobs with that and decided that 12 hour days were not for me <laughs> <laughs> i know i'm a store manager of a cafe in edinburgh and i love that more than i ever loved freelancing <laughs> <laughs> but I, I really enjoy my job i work for great people and i'm just i live with my two dogs in a lovely little flat and I never thought I could ever get to a place like this. Hmm. I actually, uh, I worked in theater. I was a carpenter in theater for a few years. So awesome. I did quite yeah. a lot of props work and um, stage and set dressing. So I, yeah. I really loved it and it's a passion, but sometimes you shouldn't work in things you love because it ruins them for you. <laughs> well, it sounds like uh, theater and TV, the culture is not much different here than it is there <laughs> so it is long hours and it's like yeah it's a lot of turnaround a lot of burnout so i can i can see why you didn't uh, stick around a whole long time with that but um do you do you have a mate now or are dating anyone or anything <laughs> i'm single not that i'm hitting on you happily. i'm not hitting on you. <laughs> you're a married man i would never that think that <laughs> <laughs> no oh, i'm yeah. quite happy on my own at the moment and i'm fine with that i'm still kind of uh, I don't ever want children, um, and part of that, I think, is a long-standing thing of um, fear of pregnancy because of morning sickness and mm. kids throwing up and stuff. I think some of that is still quite deep-seated in me. Um, I love kids, but I also like giving them back to their parents, so I'll make a great <laughs> aunt. <laughs> right. uh, well, I, I, we, we lost a dog in May, but we, have, we had two dogs, now we have one, but they throw up a lot. <laughs> It's so it's different with dogs. I don't know what it is, but you know, huh. I'm fine cleaning that up. <laughs> <laughs> it's not so much a problem with me anymore. I okay. I, I manage it. Like don't, don't get me wrong. There's times when if there's something really stressful happening in my life, um, I do. So, I'm very likely to go back to panic attacks sometimes. Um, it's like it's even like a hormonal thing, like. 
Mm-hmm. couple of days a month I'm a lot more likely to have panic attacks and I'm like what the hell is wrong with me why is this happening again and then I realize mm-hmm. um it's not something that I'm immune to still it's it does affect me occasionally but it's manageable now I know how to deal with it right I I, I mean most mental illnesses or like I have chronic depression anxiety addictions none of them are cured like you're never cured of this stuff. It's yeah, it's a constant maintenance and a constant. It's exhausting, is what it is. <laughs> yeah, I think that is like a pitfall a lot of people come across when they want a solution, or like if they've never experienced it before, they're trying to help someone. I don't think people realize that there isn't a cure. Like it is something that you might have to deal with forever, and you got to be prepared for that. But there's ways to make it manageable and there's ways to make it manageable for other people as well as just understanding Mm -hmm. that you've got to show some self-compassion and you've Mm -hmm. got to be kind to yourself because life is hard enough without giving yourself such a hard time. You've got to be kind and Mm -hmm. you've got to understand that you're dealing with and it's okay if you struggle sometimes. Uh, And I made a note that you came to Canada. You started feeling better enough to actually go across seas. I did. A lot of my friends and family at the time were very supportive, but told me afterwards, they were like, what the hell is she doing? (laughs) Why is she suddenly doing this? But no one wanted to stop me because they were so happy for me. Um, I took two weeks. I went to Vancouver Hmm. and I just, I loved it. I've always wanted to go to Canada. So I was like, I'm going to do it because I kind of thought about living there for a while um, before I realized that I don't think I could live that far away from my family. Well, no one in Canada vomits. Is that a, is that a real thing? Okay, I might have to move that. I might have to. <laughs> it's too cold. <laughs> it's too cold. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, you know, I've never even been to Vancouver. I'm in the middle. I'm like in Saskatchewan, which is like ah. smack dab in the middle of the the whole country, pretty much. So. Yeah. It, honestly, it's such a beautiful place. Everyone was so friendly and so nice. And I was just very charmed by it. I would love to go back. Um, I was very excited by the raccoons. I thought they were <laughs> just charming. <laughs> I know if you live there, it's probably very different. You don't have raccoons in Scotland? We don't, no. Huh. I know. Huh. No, they're, they're all over North America. They're was- so cute. <laughs> if they don't give you rabies, yeah, they're cute. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so after going through through this whole experience, uh, th- have you gained any wisdom or thoughts that you would like to to share, or or maybe not share? But <laughs> is there any you know is there any like real go- hardcore perspective that you you gained and you you think about? I don't know. Now I'm think- rambling. <laughs> My turn to ramble. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the main thing is to just, like, I found when I started to be able to go outside again, I was so grateful for every little thing that I came across. Like, I forgot how beautiful the night sky could be. Mm. I forgot how beautiful flowers could be and how good fresh air can smell. And just the the joy of choice of being able to like wonder what you're going to do with your day rather than know what you're going to do with your day and know how bleak it's going to be. And I think overall, if I could go back in time and I could at 14 years old, choose to go on that medication and choose to skip everything. I don't think I would because I think it was worth it. I think, all the suffering and the pain and the sadness and the loneliness I felt really was worth the insight I have now into who I am and the empathy I can feel towards people that are kind of going through something similar or who like being able to see those warning signs and people I love and checking if they're okay checking if there's any sort of comfort I can give them I think it is all worth it for that and I might have ended up somewhere very different but I don't really care because I'm happy with where I am at the moment Hmm. and I think a lot of people have kind of 
I've seen a lot of signs of agoraphobia in people since the pandemic started and people were having to isolate themselves and stay at home. And then the fear of going outside because outside is dangerous. Like it's been so crazy the past three years, seeing all of this on a worldwide scale and being like, wow, this is like a repeat of everything I went through. It made me kind of bitter in ways because um, places like you can't work for us, you can't leave your house. And now everyone works from home. I'm like, Excuse me, where was this five years ago? <laughs> but <laughs> um, you're ahead of your time. I know, right? Such a transcendent. <laughs> but it's been really hard seeing people struggle with that. And but it's also been really nice to be able to offer an insight of like stick to a schedule, stick to like have goals, have small goals and keep positive and look after yourself and make sure that you have variety no matter how small it is like all these little things that I use to just keep my spirits up it's been nice to be able to help other people by just advising um so I appreciate that too I was worried that I might take a few steps back um Mm -hmm. during all this and I might be like hey I do like the inside (laughs) um but I've been lucky enough to it's it's not really affected me hugely. Mm. Well, but I, yeah, I love isolating. <laughs> yeah, it's been kind of sadly. I have a job where I do have to go in. I would kind of like to work from home. <laughs> My poor dogs would love me to work from home, but um, <laughs> it's been nice to be able to force myself out with that. Mm. You could have a cafe from home. Oh gosh, no people coming to my house and picking up drinks. No, nope. <laughs> get out. <laughs> well, I, I think we covered everything. We were up to present day and yeah. Uh, yeah, this has been really, really great. Thank you so much for getting in touch. It really meant a lot to me to have so many people contact me and just share their stories with me. And um, it, it felt very special to have people reach out and um anything i can do to make the stigma of mental health even a little smaller or make people feel a little less lonely i feel is so worth my time so thank you so much for getting in touch with me thank you so much rachel you have a pretty fascinating story and uh, like you say, maybe it's not so uncommon. I don't know. I've, I'm not in that world of fear of vomiting other than, you know, the healthy type of fear of vomiting. I really appreciate you telling your story and for being on the podcast. So thank you again very much. Now, next week, I am speaking to Daniel Unmanageable. That's not his real last name, but that's, that's his, uh, his go-to. And I like it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep calling him that. He is the host of his own show on YouTube and on Facebook Live. It's not a podcast. I don't know what you call it. He told me, but I can't remember. It's it's a live interview. You can watch it later. He does then take the audio and make a podcast out of it. So, uh, And it's all about recovery and substance abuse. And he talks to all types of people, from people who have recovered to people that are still using to people in the government and, uh, and other kind of advocates for uh, addictions and, and whatnot. So it's he's a really great guy. He's got a really great show. It's a very popular show. And I'm actually going to be on his show, Hard Knocks Talks, on Sunday, March 6th. And it is always at 8 p.m. Saskatchewan time. I think that's central. I don't know my times or my time zones. But anyway, uh, yeah, I'll be speaking with him next episode, two weeks' time. So I'll see you there. Thank you for listening and please subscribe, rate and review however you are listening to this podcast. It only takes a moment and it really helps the show out with getting noticed. This episode has been sponsored by Penny University Bookstore, 3104 13th Avenue. Call 639-571-2186 and check out their online bookstore at pennyu.ca. The Saskatchewan Podcast Network is supported by Conexus. Wellness, however you define it, is achievable. You don't even need to figure it all out by yourself. Talk to Conexus. 
They'll give you guidance, motivation, and the push you need to reach your goals. They've got you. They're your financial partner and they know you can achieve your very best, your financial best. Prove them right. Start right at Connexus Credit Union. The Saskatchewan Podcast Network is also sponsored by Direct West. Are you a business owner looking for new avenues to promote your business? Direct West digital billboards are a great opportunity to highlight a new product, new promotion, or anything else you'd like your customers to know about. You can get local expert marketing help for your business at directwest.com. If you are having a mental health crisis, please call the Canadian Crisis Number at 1-833-456-4566. In Saskatchewan, the mobile crisis team in Prince Albert is 306-764-1011. In Regina, it's 306-525-5333. And in Saskatoon, it's 306-933-6200. Don't forget to check out my children's book, Sometimes Daddy Cries. Sometimes Daddy Cries is told through the eyes of a boy whose father suffers from depression. He sees his dad get sad, rest, and even go to the hospital, all while comparing his father's depression to a physical ailment. Available on Amazon.ca. I'll see you next time. This is Todd Redebaum saying, make your beds and take your meds. Bye!